Are you looking for truth from God's word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Clarity Christian College, formerly known as Florida Bible College. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. What a profound song that was, Lead Me to the Cross. It was a wonderfully selected song in a way because we're talking about becoming a leader like Christ. And it was really a song that was a prayer saying to the Lord, Lord, lead me because you are a leader to the cross. And when you all think of the cross, sometimes we think, of course, what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. Of course, he died there. He spilled his blood for us. And then he rose again so that we could have an eternal relationship with him, our sins forgiven and a home in heaven. And so we think about the cross, but there was a part of that song, in order to be led to the cross, we're also led not just to the action of Christ, but also to what motivated him to do that, and that would be his heart, his heart of love, and how much he really loved us. And if we want to become a leader like Christ, that's the best example we'll ever find in leadership, would be in Jesus Christ. The sacrifice that he did for those that would sometimes not follow him or respond in any way and even go as far as be the ones that were part of that whole experience of his death on the cross. And then at the same time, he was one that had such a heart for people that he really loved them. So it was a service sacrifice. And so if we're ever looking for the greatest model in leadership, it's going to be in, in Jesus Christ. Now, there are a lot of good books on leadership. If you went up to my study, you'll find many, many books on leadership. I enjoy reading it, probably because I feel my inadequacies are so great that others need to speak to me to remind me where I need to be and teach me how to get there. But all of them will in some measure leave the impression that the one who wrote it is still learning on the journey of leadership. But the finest book that was ever written on leadership is the one that you already have. So you don't need to go out and buy another book or necessarily go to another seminar. You have all that you have in the sufficiency of God's word. The beauty of it, too, is the fact if you've trusted Christ as your savior, then you have the greatest leader that has ever existed and will exist living inside of you. And so you can be a partaker of his divine nature. So all that's necessary for you to be a leader and to lead like Christ is already found in the sufficiency in Christ and, of, of course, in his word. But there are practical principles that he has left for us, not only in the teaching, but in the way he modeled. And that's what I'd like to share with you. Last week, we covered a verse that said Proverbs eleven fourteen, without wise leadership, a nation is in trouble. And we learned that without wise leadership, a family is in trouble, a marriage is in trouble, a business is in trouble. A church could be in trouble. And many of you now can look back over ministries and businesses and families that are in trouble because those are placed in a position of leadership are not leading and becoming a leader like Christ. We also learn that leadership is influence. Every time we talk to someone, every time we're around other people, even by our lifestyle, in some measure we are living an influence. And in some people are following and gaining and growing and applying. Others are maybe even being repelled and saying, that's not how I want to be. But in any case, we're still influencing others because leadership is influence. And so my, my passionate prayer for us here as that each one wouldn't just get more notes for a notebook on leadership, but first we would sense our own inadequacies and that we know the need to be a better influencer of others and to see how empty we are, but yet not to be wallowing in guilt, but to say, hey, the Lord has an answer. He's my model and he's given me the message. And I want to lean into that because I know that I have so many years left and I will be coming in contact with others and I want to touch their lives. So whether you are a leader of a small group or a family or a church or a business or you just feel like you're one of those grunt workers, this message is still for you because as long as you're around other people, you will influence them. Now, for some of you, I want to quickly say that there are no perfect leaders. I'm not a perfect leader. All those gentlemen and ladies who have written on leadership, they're not perfect either. But at the same time, I hope that we would desire maybe not perfection, but that we would try to become excellent. The best we can be, the, what the Lord has given to us. So what I've done is taken some passages of scripture on the life of Christ, and I've called them fundamental principles on leadership from the life of Christ. Now, there could be hundreds of these, yea, thousands of these. We have a few more messages that I want to give on the leadership principles of Jesus. But at the same time, I just want to cover seven. Last week we've covered four, this week I want to cover three, and then we'll move into a new topic next week. I'm looking forward to it. 
I'm going to be talking about the loaves and the fishes, if you remember the story. And we're going to learn lessons from the loaves next week. There are three hallmark lessons on leadership that we see Jesus Christ doing that we can put into our lives when we face similar dilemmas. Not so much about the loaves and the fishes, but the principles from the story of the loaves and the fishes. But let's go back into our material. For those of you who weren't able to be with us last week, we learned that principle number one is identification. We need to know who we are and whose we are. And probably it would be best to go to that. We need to know whose we are. So I would pray that you have trusted Christ as your Savior so that you know that you have been bought by the blood of Christ. You become a part of His forever family and that the Lord Himself will provide everything necessary for you to be the leader that He wants you to be. But also to know who you are. We believe very clearly that the Bible teaches that we were in the mind of God before we were born and that God has a purpose for our life. And so that's why we are strongly and unashamedly pro-life here because every person is a very important person made in the image of God. That means each one of you have been designed by God in his drawing board and to help bring you to where you are today. He's brought a lot of things into your life. Different ones will define it different ways. One way that I find it easy to define that's biblical is using the letters S-H-A-P-E. S-H-A-P-E. You might want to jot these down. I didn't come up with these. A lot of you can come up with your own words that are very similar, but the principles are biblical. The first one is the way he has made you, who you are and whose you are, is that you've been given as a Christian a spiritual gift. That's a divine motivation for you to be able to use, to build up other people for the glory of God so the church will grow. So you have a spiritual gift. It's important for you to discover that. The letter H stands for heart or passion or interest. Within each of you, you have a unique interest that he has given to you. If you look back over some of the great leaders like James Dobson, he has a tremendous interest in the family. He'll rarely speak about prophecy. And then you have others like John Wolverd who loves to speak about prophecy. And he won't speak a whole lot about the family. It doesn't mean that they think less of that. It's because God placed within them a heart that beats after certain issues that defines them to help add technicolor and surround sound to the body of Christ. But what are you interested in? And it's good to focus. And we'll talk about that in a moment. The next would be the letter A, which would be abilities. Certain ones of you have a, an adeptness to a skill set that makes it easy for you. And so whatever that would be, it would be an ability that the Lord has given to you. And some might refer to that as a talent. But when we think of talent, we think of piano or art, which are talents. But you might have talent in the area of writing or talent in the area of construction or talent in the area of technology. Whatever your ability is, God has given you that ability to take that information and you, because you've enjoyed it and God has given you some strength in that area, it became an ability that you know how to do. And the next is the letter P, which would be for personality. And each one of you and I, all of us, have been wired with a particular personality. And generally, we have a combination. We might be little people. Some we might be a little task. Some might be a little bit more outgoing. Some might be a little more passive. But you have a unique personality style. Nobody has a bad personality. It's what you do with your personality that makes it good or bad. We often say in our Discover Your Divine Design class that if you are a happy-go-lucky 17-year-old, when you become 70, you'll be a happy-go-lucky 70-year-old. If you're mean and nasty at 17, you probably won't live to be age 70, you know? It's your personality. It's what you do with it. And of course, we know that your gifting and personality, Jesus has it all. He lives within you, and you can draw from Him. The last is the letter E, which is the word experiences. And that really defines us even more differently because you have had a different experience than others have had. Carol and I can say that we have never, in a sense, birthed children in our house. And many of you have. On the other side, we have adopted children and some of you have not. So everyone has a different experience. They're not necessarily good or bad. It's what the Lord has either prescribed or permitted into your life to help you to, be, to, help you to become what you should become. So that's your shape. So it goes back to principle number one, which is simply identification. Do you know that you belong to the Lord because you've trusted him as your savior? And so you know who you are. And now you know because of that who you are, because he and his sovereignty and lordship has shaped you to be what you are. And that's going to be a lifelong discovery. The second principle is the principle of clarification. Do I know what he wants me to accomplish? Jesus said, I know where I came from and where I'm going. So for some of you, it might be a time for you to power down and to really sense from where has the Lord taken me? And then because he's taken me on this journey, where is it that he is now directing me toward? And what would that be? What does he want me to accomplish with my life? 
The worst would be that we would become a snowflake in the blizzard of humanity or a blade of grass on a golf course. That we would be someone of great significance because of who he has made us to be and what he wants us to accomplish. So what does he want you to accomplish? What's your zone? Number three, the principle of motivation. The motivation. Do I know who am I trying to please? Now, obviously, we are trying to serve others. and We hope that we bring joy and satisfaction to their life and in some measure that they sense a... Um, a desire to be around us, so there is a little pleasure there, but we don't always dance to everybody else's song. So at the same time, am I trying to please the Lord? And Jesus says, I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. I'm enjoying continually reading the life story of Hudson Taylor. And once again, last night, I read again where he said that one of the major character traits that seemed to be absent in the church of his day in the 1800s was this, self-denial. That means say no to some of the extra luxuries in life and to really sense that what I have with the Lord is all I need. So instead of just merely always seeking to please ourselves, to make sure that we're motivated to seek and to bring pleasure and fame to one person, and that would be the Lord. The fourth principle is collaboration, and that's simply, do we have a small group or a team or a family, someone around us that will hold us accountable, that will come alongside us to to add value to our life, to communicate out of all the people their unconditional love for us. So do we have a particular small group for accountability, for help, for encouragement, for affirmation? Who do we have that we can count on that when we have an issue or a problem or a need, they can call us at a moment's notice and we'll be there for them and they will be there for us. Well, let's continue now, and this is some new material for today. So this is called the principle of concentration through the life of Christ, and that is, do I focus on what is important versus what is urgent? Many years ago, there was a handout given to many leaders, and it went something like this. It was called the tyranny of the urgent. And as you read through that, you became more and more convicted because it was sharing with you, as you read it, how that we are mostly caught up into a whirlwind of responding to everything that is urgent around us. So it has now taken us down the road of urgency rather than around the, down the road of what's important, which then confused and confounded and stressed out our life. And it was really calling us to be more careful and more proactive and more purpose-driven so that we would then do the things that were more important to do rather than what was merely just urgent. Look, at, if you will, at Luke chapter 9, verse 51, and here's what you read. It says, As the time approached for him, Christ, to be taken up to heaven, Jesus rose resolutely set out for Jerusalem. You know what that tells me? Is that as much as was going on in his life, he remembered who he was, what he was called to do, and that was to go to Jerusalem because soon he would go to Calvary where he would die on a cross and rise again. And so he was resolutely going to Jerusalem to the very place being led to, as we heard sung this morning, to the cross of Christ. So I said all of that to say this, how easy distractions can come into our life. And think about it for just a moment. Think about how times that you're busy thinking about what you need to do and probably one of the quickest distractions we have would be our cell phone. Have you ever thought about that? And this is one of those times that I wish that a cell phone would go off, you know, in church. Now relax, don't have your phone call your friend right now, but cell phones have a tendency to do that. And I'm not beating up on cell phones, so my, my message isn't about cell phones, but it is about this, how it doesn't take much for quickly for us to be distracted away from the things that we should be doing. And I guess the question would be, it goes all the way back to what we said earlier in our message, and that is, do you know who you are? Do you know whose you are? Do you know what your purpose is in life? Are you deciding to please him and only him? You can't stop distractions, but what you might be able to do is position some of those distractions so that you can take authority over them in the name of the Lord to know what you need to do. And it will take a person who is intimate with the Lord. And I'll talk about that in a moment because there is a spiritual governor that will help you. So it's not just a list of do's and don'ts. It's really born about an intimacy with the Lord. So I would like to encourage you, all of us, that we would make it a habit to hear the the Lord, listen to God in our life. Look, if you will, at Mark 135. I'm going to give you this verse, but I encourage you to get the sermon that I preached the first Sunday of this year because it was all on this verse. It says, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. If it's your Bible that you have open on your lap, you might want to underline the phrase, very early. Now, as I did on that Sunday, as I will do here now, 
It's not that you are required to get up in the morning to have your quiet time. David had it at different times. Others had it in the middle of the night. Jesus, though, seemed to have his aloneness with God at least identified in Scripture that he got up early. So I might lean in that if I have a choice to make. You might choose to go early, although you're not required to do that. The rest might be something that would be very much important for us to embrace. So very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up. Circle the phrase, got up. That means he got out of bed. He got away from the comforts of that moment because he was going to go to number two. He left the house, so circle that. So he got up and he got out. Now, I don't know what it would be for you. So maybe for you is getting up and getting away from something that is so familiar to you that it's easy for you to let your mind subconsciously go into the do's and the don'ts of what you have to do. If it's in the kitchen, you're thinking about dishes. If it's on the lanai, you might be thinking about backyard responsibilities. So whatever it might be, get away from something that is so familiar with you so that you can't get to do that so you can concentrate on the Lord. Then it says he went off to a solitary place. So there was some distance involved in this. So I don't know what your distance would be, but it would be something to get him away from any type of distraction. And there he went to pray. And how important that would be to find a place where we pray. Now, when I think of communing with the Lord, although it talked about praying here, true prayer is almost like a conversation. I talk, then I listen. I ask, the Lord responds. So when I get to the Lord, I want to speak to him. Now, if I was to suggest that you do this for 30 minutes a day, I want you to know that's not coming out of any Bible verse that says that you're required to do that. And so I'm going to be very careful because for some of you, when you hear the word 30 minutes, you're going to say, there's no way I can't do it for 30 minutes. I can hardly be alone with God and concentrate fully on him for 30 seconds, let alone for 30 minutes. Some of the most difficult times in your life is when you shut down and absolutely do nothing. You shut the phone off, you get away from it all. It is hard to be alone. Now, that's why I would like to challenge you. I would like to encourage in as much love as I can that you would find a reasonable amount of time that stretches you that you would have alone with God. Are you with me still? And perhaps at this time, while you might be talking with the Lord, give some time to total silence. You don't go through your prayer chart. You don't pray for the missionaries. You don't pray for your personal needs. You don't pray for your family. Now, you've done that in a few minutes, but you let it alone. And try this, folks. This is a... The sages used to call this disciplines. Today, we might call it a habit. Whatever it is, it can be a struggle. But then take a moment. And after you've talked to the Lord, after you've spent a few moments reading His Word, if you will sit in holy silence before him as a leader and just listen to what he might have for you at that moment if you don't mind i'd like to su- suggest that our life would be balanced with our time with people which we have plenty of that and then also our time alone with god if you will look at luke chapter 5 verse 15 and 16 and here's what you read in one translation it says now news about jesus spread even more and crowds came to hear him and to be healed, but Jesus often slipped away to be alone so he could pray. When I was doing a study on the original language for that passage, I don't know what translation you have on your lap in your Bible, but one that I found that seemed to be the most in agreement with multiple Greek scholars said it this way. And the reason I want to unpack this is because I am so passionate about a person's quiet time with God as it helps them as a leader, because we need to hear from the leader of leaders, the Lord. This is coming from Lenski, and here's what he says and how he's translated verse 15 and verse 16. It says, but more the report concerning Christ kept spreading, and great crowds kept coming together to hear him and to be healed from their ills. But he himself kept going quietly to lonely places and praying. Now, that's a great theological illustration of a truth. Now, how can we apply it for our life? Obviously, we're not the Lord. But maybe some of you have a particular career where people have to come to you for advice. You're in a profession, whether it's medical or whether it's legal or whether it's accounting, where people are clamoring after you all the time. Or perhaps you're not that, but you are a stay-at-home mom that's just as important, but you're being clamored upon from your kids. Mommy, open this. Daddy, would you answer this question? Mommy, would you listen to me here? Daddy, can I show you that? And it seems like wherever you go, people are coming to you. 
Now we can go through almost every career, whatever you might do, but people are after you to either sell you, ask you, request something from you. So in a sense, I'm glad this was in scripture so we could then look to the leader of leaders who had many people to come. And if you notice, it said so that he would heal them of their ills. So you're in a profession so that you would provide them sound advice. That's like healing. A mother that would maybe make the path straighter or the burden lighter for the child. Whatever it might be, they're coming to you so you would change their world. And probably it's because something's wrong and they're desperate. And so they're more desperate for you. So they come to you with the request that's more pointed. Now it goes on to say this. But he himself kept going quietly to lonely places and praying. None of us in here would say that he rejected his responsibility or his service spirit to help these people. But he knew how to posture himself to make sure that he would model for us what leaders would do. Now his tank was filled spiritually. Physically he would get tired. So he showed us that when people come, what do we do? We still need to take authority over our calendar, our smartphones, and say we need to back away for, for a while. And I love the way it says in the Greek, as often as they kept coming to him, he kept going to a quiet place. Now it sounds like as they were running after him, Jesus was running away from him. I don't want you to think that. Although, if you unpack this passage and other passages, you will see that they really were. As often as he tried to get alone, they did chase after him. But the model was still getting alone to get our thoughts together so we can hear from God and what he would have for us. The principle of concentration. Focus on what's important, not nearly or merely what's urgent. All right, let's go to number six, the principle of meditation. Do I continue to listen to the Lord? Now, it's very simple to focus on the Lord, but if I focus on God, the emphasis is still, I need to listen to Him. And I pray that we do that. I pray that we do that on a regular basis. So let me go on a little bit further. <clears throat> when you uh, listen to the Lord and you want to hear from him, something that's helped me. Now, again, what I do does not necessarily mean you have to do what I do, but I will just share with you on a personal basis. Um, I have a three-word three question that I ask the Lord periodically throughout the day. Would you like to know what it is? Pick at your own question, but this works for me. Lord, what next? That's all. Lord, what next? Sometimes, Lord, what now? Now, I want you to know, I never hear an audible voice from God, so you can relax on that. And often, I often don't get a, an impression that, okay, Stan, you got to go do this. When I don't get any formal impression of some type, or I don't have a time to clear out the Kaaba, I'm sensing, I keep moving, but I do pause, Lord, what now, what next? So I will keep moving, and after a while, I'll pause again, what now, what next? You'll be amazed at how many of you will email me, and some of you will be amazed how many emails I get here and all over the country. And how many phone calls we get at our house. And most of those, before I respond, it's not a long prayer, folks. It's simply, Lord, what now? What next? What do I say? What do I do? May I just encourage you to maybe begin to discipline yourself to not just throw words out there. I mean, focus on the Lord. Is he listening to you? And then say those things and wait just a moment and see if that hasn't, it doesn't help you. Now, may I share this? I have not always done that. I look back over my life and the, the majority of the mistakes that I've made in leadership has been because I've relied too much on who I am, what I knew, too much on impulsivity, and I would just plow ahead and do it and not take a moment and say, Lord, what now? What next? What do I say? What do I do? Now, does that mean every time I do that? No. But I want to practice the presence of God as a leader and how important it is to continually listen to the Lord. I think one of the single greatest sources of stress in our life, this is my opinion now, is when I'm disconnected from the Lord. When I am operating in the flesh, trying to make the decisions or do the things that I want to do that satisfies what I think should be done because it's all about me, you know what I'm saying, I get under a tremendous amount of stress. And when I have stress, it snowballs in my life. And I pray for you folks that we would now sense the presence of God. This um, last year, 
Every, let me say it this way. Every year at Christmas, when we get together for dinner with the deacons and the, the, deacons and the pastors here, um, we, um, I like to give them a book. One book was on spiritual leadership by Henry Blackaby and his son. I would encourage you to get that book if you want it. The next was a book on spiritual leadership by J. Oswald Sanders called Spiritual Leadership. This is Joe Pons, and I want to thank you for listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Clarity Christian College. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It's the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. That's makeitclear.org. Thank you for helping us make it clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please email us at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. That's tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear.